One of the most dangerous occupations was not that of an infantryman, but as a pilot and a training officer during the First World War. Both flying and aero mechanics were in its infancy, and the race was on to develop another form of combat. Initially, aircraft were used for reconnaissance missions, photographing troop and ammunition movements, and then developed quickly into an advanced mechanism of war. A distinctive landmark in Maruya is the Uniting Church. It holds memories of a local boy, a World War I flying ace who began his life in the Maruya district. James Stuart Leslie Ross was the son of John Ross, the town's carpenter, joiner and undertaker. James was brought up in Maruya and became the messenger boy at Maruya Post Office. James learnt signals quickly and gained employment at the Sydney GPO as a telegraphist. Telegraphists were often well-educated people with an aptitude for technical work. In 1915, he became a Morse operator with the Pacific Cable Board, sending and receiving international telegraphic messages by Morse code. James Stuart Leslie Ross enlisted on August 17, 1916 in the Australian Imperial Force as a private after completing several wireless and communication courses. He also trained in South Carlton near London as an air mechanic. A high death rate of pilots meant there were many opportunities for new recruits. He continued his studies in the most dangerous of jobs as a pilot at Andover, London and was promoted to Lieutenant and posted to the number no. 2 Squadron Australian Flying Corps. It's a, it's a very small unit. There's a very small unit. We talk about, you know, number one squadron, number two squadron, and they're tiny. And they're made up of pilots, a few of them, and air crew who are also learning on the job, you know, trying to work out how an engine works and how you, how you repair it and so on. Um, so they had a much tighter esprit de corps because they were such a, a small group. They had a very um, intense understanding of their value they did believe that they made a real difference and weren't being used as well as they could be. It's more daring do, that's why I sort of think the spirit in the AFC and the light horse is in some ways similar. The light horse is obviously much bigger, but even so, you know, a regiment in the light horse is about half the size of a battalion in the infantry, so they're smaller. Um, and more fluid and, and, you know, sort of, if we make a charge, we can make a difference. And that's the way the AFC thought about itself too. If we fly cleverly and smartly and shoot them down, we can make a difference. And that's how they, that's how they thought of themselves. So it's more romantic, I suppose, and, but incredibly dangerous. Um, life expectancy in the infantry wasn't that good, but it was vastly better than, than the AFC. Incredibly dangerous. Number 2 Squadron was heavily involved in the German 1918 Spring Offensive, then in support of the French during the German Summer Offensive in Marne. They also participated in the Allied Counter-Offensive of August 1918. The last major combat operation for the squadron was on November 9, 1918. It was a double-edged sword Many mechanics and engineers struggled with the advancements in aircraft technology and as a result, many accidents occurred, along with inexperienced pilots with very limited flying hours, combined with aircraft being shot down constantly, made it one of the most dangerous occupations of the war. The Australian Flying Corps was um, coincidentally, coincidentally uh, begun in uh, our winter of 1914. So nobody could see war coming in Australia, but they did know that air technology had to become part of our, our defence effort. We had a small army, we had a small navy, a very professional navy, um, but we needed an air force as well. So they started training at Point Cook in, I think I'm right in saying, about early July 1914. Very small force, um, uh, very few pilots, very few air crew, very few people in charge, but at least we had made a start. Um, and then when war was declared, uh, the Australian Flying Corps therefore became uh, an arm of, of our endeavours. Again, extremely small, but played a reasonably important part in the warfare in the desert um, in 1915, 1916 uh, and, and later. Um, moved to um, England, uh, 
hazardous, uh, absolutely hazardous. But the interesting thing about the Royal Flying Corps and the Australian Flying, Australian Flying Corps is that the technology of aircraft was changing incredibly quickly. So that what they were flying in in 1914, you wouldn't recognise what they were flying in in 1918. So aircraft became much more useful in the fighting. Um, and indeed, uh, when General Monash planned his battle at Le, Le Hamel in July 1918, he put all areas of his troops available to him together, working together, so tanks and all that sort of stuff. But he was using aircraft to resupply his soldiers on the land. So one of the most hazardous things was, of course, getting fresh supplies up to soldiers who were advancing rapidly, which we hadn't seen much of, more ammunition, that sort of, all those sorts of supplies. And he had the bright idea of getting um, aircraft to, 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 to do that, and that worked extremely well. And, but that shows you how sophisticated aircraft were getting. They also used, of course, as you probably know, in aerial photography, so people could understand the terrain over which they were going to fight and see the disposition of the enemy's defences. Um, they were used in bombing, in a sense. Um, you know, I mean, leaning the other side and dropping a bomb out isn't that sophisticated, but that's what it was. Uh, 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 but increasingly important, very hazardous, very dangerous, and possibly more dangerous in training than in combat, because you had to learn to fly, and nobody had. Um, and so there were a v the very high proportion of training uh, accidents and deaths, sadly. National Archives records indicate, whilst at a French hospital for several bouts of influenza, Lieutenant Ross was court-martialed when he and a mate were found to be eating strawberries and cream inside a green grocer by the special police. They were suspected of neglecting to obey standing orders for officer patients to enter any houses, shops, cafe, restaurant, hotel, private cabins or any public place of refreshment or amusement. He was charged and kept in open arrest for 33 days awaiting trial at a general court martial. Ross pleaded not guilty, but was found guilty and was fined and reprimanded in June 1918. Lieutenant Ross was wounded in a dogfight against 11 Germans suffering a gunshot wound to the back of the right thigh and managed to bring his plane back safely. He spent time in the 39th hospital in Javier in France. He also suffered influenza and was sent to England to convalesce. During the AIF demobilisation of troops from Europe to Australia, Prime Minister Billy Hughes offered a prize of £10,000 to the first flight from Great Britain to Australia via Alexandria, Singapore and Darwin to be completed within 720 consecutive hours, 30 days before midnight on the 31st of December 1920. The air race was deemed to be for professional pilots only. In a strange twist of fate, Lieutenant Ross had all demobilisation leave orders cancelled and entered the air race by the AIF command along with other officers. Lieutenant Ross and great friend Lieutenant Roger M. Douglas, MC and DCM from Charters Towers, who also was an experienced pilot, chose an Alliance P-2 Seabird because of its newly developed long-range fuel tanks. Lieutenant Douglas, with Lieutenant Ross's navigator, left Honslow Aerodrome at approximately 11.33 a.m. on November 13, 1919. About 11.40 a.m., the aircraft was seen over Surbiton, flying on a straight course in a southeasterly direction under the clouds which were low. Over Surbiton, the machine was flying normally when the pilot shut off his engine and the aircraft immediately went into a right-hand spin, just before reaching the ground. It apparently recovered, but again continuing the spin crashed into a small orchard. Both Lieutenant Douglas and Lieutenant Ross were killed instantly. Air Ministry Accident Investigations Branch determined that there was no evidence that any fault in construction contributed to the accident. Lest we forget.